nomine Patris, et Fidi, Spiritu Sancti, Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostre, Amen. In nomine Patris, et Fidi, Spiritu Sancti, Amen. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us and save us, Amen. Brethren in Christ, laudato Jesus Christus. In secular. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Jesus is King. This is the Terror of Demons morning show. Reclaiming traditional Catholic masculinity. Make sure that you pick up the book. Links below. This is the message and the movement that we hope to spread. Is the arising of the men of God to initiate the new crusade against the enemies of Holy Church. So... Today's topic is we're going to be continuing going through Lent with Fatima. And we're going to go through in great detail. I'm going to try to critique whatever Kennedy says, and uh, we'll see how this goes. Um, welcome to Lent. Happy Lent to everybody. Hope your Lent is off to a great start. Uh, first full week this week. Um, hope all of you are fasting, almsgiving, and prayer <clears throat> is gaining some momentum. I wanted to show off what my, my wife has done to our family altar, which is, uh, here's our setup here. Uh, she made these stations of the cross with mm -hmm. these, these candles, which, uh, you're, I don't know if, uh, any Kennedy, your children are like mine, but, uh, yeah, I think we talked about this, uh, little boys are pyros. They all love yeah. fire. <laughs> and so if they can't, if they're not, uh, paying attention to the prayers, they want to pay attention to the candles. And, uh, I got this from Taylor Marshall talked about using the snuffer. Uh, yeah. they love doing the snuffer. Uh, so that you, you light the candles and then you snuff them. Uh, but, it, there's something truly incredible, and I think this is such an important part of raising our children in the faith, is your wife decorating the domestic church according to the liturgical season. Mm -hmm. And it's something that the church has always given us in the actual church because there's always been special decorations. And mm -hmm. I find it to be very spiritual, especially for the children as they grow up, seeing the decorations, entering into the season. And so I think it's very important. And I just wanted to share that and show off what my wife did, because I think it's amazing. Um, we also, she made our, we've got, uh, we made these family stations of the cross booklets. Oh, beautiful. And they have, um, they have this great artwork actually this great American artist, Ben Stahl from 1954, not everything from the 1950s is aesthetically pleasing, but this particular stations is, is, I think is excellent. Um, and uh, so it has a, all the stations. And then we have just an abbreviated version of the St. Alphonsus um, station. So it's just kind of cut down for, for a family version. So it's really great. I really like doing it inside the home to continue the domestic church uh, experience. So hmm. that's what's going on with us so far in Lent. Kennedy, you guys got anything going on? What's up with you? Yeah, well, we decided to do daily mass um, as a family, which has been good. Um, so uh, we're going to mass at 8 a.m. today. But we have this. So the liturgy of the home people um, who ha we ma they made that beautiful thing that yeah, you talked about. about. Yeah, we talked about that at Epiphany, at Epiphany or the Christmas 12 days calendar. <clears throat> And they have an amazing uh, Lent, like it truly is. This, this, I'll just show quickly here. Um, I don't know if you guys can see that pretty well there. That's awesome. Here, I, I can put it on the screen too with the with their website. Okay, let me see. It is, it is um, like I mean, my oldest son is is yeah. There you go. My oldest son is five, and so my son. I mean, even my three year old, um, my five year old, my four year old, my three year old. Um. They come down every morning and they see this calendar and they basically say, what day are we now? What day are we now? And so they're following through 
with this really beautiful artwork every single day of Lent. Um, and it truly is remarkable. I mean, this, these people, I, I was actually, my, my, my wife was talking to the, the people who run this and they do it as a family. <clears throat> and um, it's just like a family business. So I'm hoping that we can promote them uh, and help them get business because this kind of stuff is invaluable. You know, one of the hardest things about being a, um, you know, traditional Orthodox faithful Catholic in today's world is we're like strangers in a strange land. You know, I mean, we're discovering this faith that's from a time before we were born <laughs> for the most of us, we didn't really grow up with it. And, um, so we're trying to find ways to beautify our homes, to do these things like you, your wife has done. And, um, it has to be our own, right? It has to be natural. It has to be organic. We can't just sort of go to a Catholic bookstore or whatever, see a ton of statues and just like put them in our house and say, now we're, now our house is Catholic. You know, it's got to be something that actually fits um, with the decor and sort of blends in properly. And I really like that about this Liturgy of the Home stuff because this is a perfect example of bringing the old good stuff and in a way that is accessible to us because you buy the membership or you buy uh, a one-time purchase of this calendar um, because they do stuff for literally every single liturgical thing of the year. Um, so you just print this off. You print this off in four or five different pages, whatever it is, and you put it on a piece of poster board or however you want to put it in a frame and you have this beautiful artwork for a season. So this goes through every single day of Lent um, and my children absolutely love it. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, that's really been wonderful for us. And, uh, we use their stuff for every season at this point. And it's amazing because it's all original artwork. All of it is absolutely original. So they do it. And the amount of work that goes into this, <clears throat> this has, it's not just general kind of like, you know, this is the big days in Lent. It actually is on the chronological calendar for each year. Um, so they have to make a new one of these each season. So anyway, shout out to them. Yeah, liturgythehome.com. Looks like I was just checking out because I, I bought a few of them <laughs> earlier, but I was trying to find a way to get a good printing of it. Um, okay. So it looks like you can get the $9 package per month. Yeah. And then you've get, you get the calendars and booklets and monthly dedication images. Yep. So That's this is, great. yeah, I think we'll do this too. This is excellent. So yeah. So anyhow, there it is. Your you domestic go. church uh, fun for the morning and the week, first week of Lent. So mm -hmm. concerning Fatima, we've yeah. got an excellent uh, timeline that is this one on the Fatima Center website? Is this where this comes from? <clears throat> you know what? I actually don't know. This is one that um, I wouldn't be surprised if it is. Maybe Do you want to just pull up the Fatima Center, Fatima Center website? Yeah, sure. Um, and maybe we can just navigate through it. I know and there I was... Um, I, I searched for uh, Fatima Center timeline before, and it didn't show this one. But uh, looks like it's got. Here's um, okay. So here's the complete Fatima timeline. Yeah. This is I just searched Fatima Center timeline, and yeah. I got this site. So the Fatima website, Fatima.org, it really is like the most unique Fatima thing on the internet. <laughs> it really is. Um, there's other good places. I mean, Tradition Family Property has a lot of great Fatima information. Tradition Family Property has a ton of really great Our Lady of Good Success information. I think they're kind of one of the, the best places for that. Um, <clears throat> so if you just look there, Tim, if you look at, uh, go to uh, hover your hover your mouse over Fatima in depth. <clears throat> so there you can just see the drop down menu is every, th you know, major thing you'll need to know. So if you just go to click on Fatima the facts. Mm hmm. Um, you open that up there and then you'll see, you know, if you're thinking, okay, I know about Fatima, um, but you know, where do I start? Well, this is a good place to start. Um, there's tons of resources there just on the facts of it. And, um, it gives you all the basics and there's even lots of books, um, that you can get for free or for like donation. So, um, you know, full length books, two, three, 400 pages, you can download them as a PDF and use it as an ebook or you can just, um, you know, call in to the Fatima Center and they'll send you a copy for whatever the price for shipping and donation is. And then these three books I have here, I'm going to show these. <clears throat> these are by Frère Michel de la Sainte Trinité, Brother Michael of the Holy Trinity. And he's from the Little Brothers of the Sacred Heart. I actually don't know much about that order, but he's sort of the most amazing biographer of everything Fatima. So 
There's volume number one. It's called The Whole Truth About Fatima, Science and the Facts. And he's using the word science in the more uh, theological sense, like just the, the, the truth of, of the events and things. Here's the second, um, well, I only have the French version, but this is the second one, and it's called, uh, well, All the Truth About Fatima, and it's, and it's um, uh, The Secret and the Church. So they go chronologically. So this one goes just about the events in 1917 mainly. Well, actually, 1916 as well with the angel visiting, which is an overlooked part which is a huge, wonderful part for um, devotion to the whole Eucharist. And um, it actually really speaks to the truth of the apparition as a very unique apparition, not just, um, if it was an actual, they call them sort of like, an, the, the ter terms he used is an exterior apparition. Um, there can be apparitions in various ways, and all of them are real, but there can be sort of an intellectual vision. Um, but uh, he makes a great comparison between the apparition of um, uh, of uh, the angel and of Our Lady of Fatima to the children and what happened with Joan of Arc. Uh, because when you read about what happened with Joan of Arc, um, you know, when they're interrogating her, they'll ask, you know, well, how do you see them? And she basically says, like, in this room, you know, like, like they're, 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 I can touch them. They're right there. It's like they're physically here. Um, and uh, the children actually receive Holy Communion from the angel. In the in the uh, angelic apparitions in 1916 before 1917. Anyway, and then here is the third one, and it is about the third secret, and this goes uh, through that timeline. There, there is a fourth one that I don't have right now, um, but anyway. So those are the sort of if you go to the website and you get these three, and you have these three books. It's like as far as the basics uh, of everything that's happened leading up to our current time you'll basically have everything you need to know um and then that timeline that we have that's just something that sort of we have shared at work um and i've used it for you know uh, our calendar for example that's out right now we have a timeline on there um, and i don't have everything from that document on it but do you want to pull that timeline up for people to see Yes, I got it right here. And I wanted to just quickly share a few things that I learned in my research for my book. And this okay. is going to be a part of the book. Uh, let's see if I can blow this up a little bit. Okay. Yeah. So because this because this is going to start way back in 1830, but yeah. I'm going to go all the way back to 1492 because oh. there's an interesting connection with the Immaculate Conception. And the reason is because the Immaculate Conception <laughs> is the dogma which states that everyone is under original sin but our lady right of of humans obviously our lord is not a human but um the idea is that the the central the central error in my mind kennedy if, if you agree or disagree here the central error is essentially a pelagianism of our modern era which is essentially mm -hmm. an idea that original sin is either uh, non-existent or it's not really a big problem so therefore we can just build society the, the big it's a gnostic idea the big the big problem is ignorance if we just give everybody public education then we'll be fine we don't we don't need to rely on divine grace to heal original sin yeah. so the idea of an um, the immaculate conception is the exaltation of only one human who does not have original sin and so mm -hmm. I, there's these interesting connections because in the Americas, which is where the birth, uh, so much of the birth of this idea is coming from in America. So in 1492, Christopher Columbus lands in the Americas on the <laughs> feast of Our Lady of the Pillar, right. which is already prophesied back in the first century. Um, but his flagship is, is actually called Santa Maria de la Immaculada Concepcion. Yeah. So he lands the flagship to the Americas is the Immaculate Conception. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that later, the first successful sort of liberal revolution is actually the act of abjuration <laughs> of the Dutch in 1581, who are rebelling against the Spanish. And they have sort of a declaration of independence, which is essentially... Um, trying to get out of church authority, out of the church Council of Trent, and use use this as a pretext to revolt against their sovereign. 
that's in 1581. So it's really interesting is that there's this miraculous battle, which is b fought uh, between the army of Flanders, which is the Spanish, the loyal Spanish uh, and the Netherlands who are fighting against these rebel Dutch. So 1585 is when they have this miraculous, the miracle of Empel, which is where an, an outnumbered Spanish force, they were, they, he was this Spanish Tertio was digging a trench and he said, this trench will be my grave because they're surrounded about to die, right? So he <laughs> digs a trench and he finds an image of Mary, the Immaculate Conception. Mm -hmm. And so then they <laughs> crusade against the Dutch with this image. God provides a miraculous victory. Once again, the Immaculate Conception is sort of the banner of the crusade against this liberalism, this, uh, this denial of original sin. And then all the way back, uh, all the way forward to 1776, which is when George Washington, on the one hand, is founding, he's he's putting the Capitol's keystone on the Capitol in Washington on Mas with Masonic rituals, yep. proclaiming the year of Masonry, 580 whatever. At the same time as it's happening, the foundation stone of <coughs> the Church of Our Lady of the Immaculate Conception is mm -hmm. being also founded in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And one of those two buildings was actually destroyed. Mm -hmm. the, the, actually, the Washington Capitol was destroyed by the British in the War of 1812. Shout um, out. <laughs> so, so You're welcome, it, America. You're welcome. So I think there's some interesting connections between the Immaculate <laughs> Conception, because it, in my mind, it really is the central error uh, of the modernists going all the way back to the Dutch. So what what do you think about that, Kennedy? Do you think that that, that is the central error? What's your thought? Yeah. Um, well, it's amazing when you look at the continuity of Marian apparitions um, in history. It's, I mean, it's, there's so much there. Um, you know, even if you just think back to Mexico, I mean, Our Lady of Guadalupe, which is, everyone knows, is um, the most important one in my life. Um, and that has a link to another, you know, that has a link to Fatima even because, um, basically it's a prophecy of the church's triumph over the crescent moon. And that's what uh, our lady is standing on. And that's a, goes back to the time when Spain was occupied by the Moors and the Berbers. And I guess it was just the Moors, um, the North African is Islam and all that sort of stuff. And, um, that's linked to Our Lady of Good Success in other ways as well. I mean, everything. I mean, I mean, it's Our Lady. So, you know, she doesn't just show up randomly with no continuity. Um, all of these apparitions have something to do with one another, and they all feed off of each other. And the historical, you know, the Battle of Lepanto has a link to Our Lady of Guadalupe, for example, because the banner, uh, Don, Don John, you know, of Austria, he was using the banner of Our Lady of Guadalupe from Mexico because it was known there by the bishop that that would be his battle cry going against the Islam Islamic forces from the east. And somehow that's linked back to Spain to the 700s, 1200s, whenever it was. I mean, it's all connected, um, almost as if there's a divine hand behind it through providence, you know. And, um, <clears throat> but, uh, as far as the dogma of the Immaculate Conception goes, it is fundamental because um, this is this is why, um, you know, with the Nestorian heresy, for example, um, you know, trying to not call Mary the mother of God, um, why it's so important is because if you mess up on your Mariology, then you mess up on your Christology. You know, this goes back to the Bible when she says, my soul magnifies the Lord, right? The more we look at Mary the more easily we are able to magnify who God is because they're intimately connected. I mean, he chooses from all eternity and his divine wisdom to be incarnate in our lady's womb, um, which means that understanding this divine vessel, if you want to call it, that is indispensable for understanding who God is. Um, so if you deny something about the immaculate Virgin, then you'll deny basically the truth of reality. Uh, in some way or another, because you're going to deny the ontological nature of what it means to be in relation properly as the creature to the creator. Um, and that's manifest in Christ, 
the creator becoming incarnate and in creature who is his mother, who in the human sense brings him forth. It's just astonishing. So uh, you're exactly correct. And that makes, I mean, from a historical perspective, I was talking to Bug Hall. I have an interview with him at the Fatima Center YouTube, former actor, Little Rascals. Um, he was a child star and things, and he had a massive conversion. And um, he, he was talking about how when he was uh, like an atheist skeptic, and he had a friend of it's it's in the interview, but basically Cole's notes. He was an atheist skeptic, whatever. His friend had a conversion to Catholicism. That he was his writing partner. So he was trying to debunk Catholicism the whole time, as you do, thought he was smarter than he was and um, really began to look into the history of the Catholic Church. And he realized the history of the Catholic Church is just the history of everything, um, because every single thing he looked into, he found a link to something amazing and miraculous and divine uh, apparitions, historical events, whatever, um, you know. The, so this makes sense, what you're saying of of uh, the links between um, the American founding and Immaculate Conception and things, because ultimately Our Lady is Queen of Heaven and Earth. So um, that includes America, <laughs> whether we want to admit it or not. So yeah, that's a wonderful connection you made. Yeah, it, it seems to me that mm. the the most devastating thing to me about the Protestant revolt is that they remove the cult of Mary. Yeah. And that is what sets up the the true revolt because the protestants kind of are always they're always uh susceptible they're vulnerable to being reconverted until mm -hmm. the modern era that's when the 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 modernism really sets in mm -hmm. um and that's when woman as a a uh, figure an ideal is truly attacked directly right, right when mary is being exalted um more and more as the ideal, uh, because the, I mean, modern feminism is essentially an attack on the Virgin Mary. Mm. Is what it is. It's an attack on the ideal of womanhood <clears throat> in the Virgin Mary. And so yeah. that's why all men of God need to arise and defend her honor because yeah. she is our lady. She is the perfect woman. And there's nothing to be shamed about the Virgin Mary being the perfect woman. And this is what all women need to be inspired by is our lady mm -hmm. um but anyhow uh we'll probably only have time for this this sort of intro uh 19th century um so tell us about what happens here in this 19th century let me pull this thing back up sure. um so we've got a cut uh, it looks like a trifecta of large apparitions that are happening in the 19th century yeah. to sort of set this up yeah so we have the Blessed Mother appears to St. Catherine Labore at the Rue, La, uh, Rue de Pâques Chapel um, in Paris. So this is the Miraculous Medal. Um, and then that's 1830. And then 16 years later, we have the Blessed Mother appears to Mélanie Calva and Maxime Giraud at uh, La Salette. Okay. And La Salette is astonishing as well. I mean, um, if, you, if you look at the continuity between our Lady of Good Success, uh, La Salette, and Fatima. They're all sort of like um, three sides or something like that. Of I don't know if that's, I'm trying to think of an analogy here, but it's like a, you know, if you think of a triangle, like they're all uh, an integral piece of that um, because they all talk about, well, basically chastisement, apostasy, uh, but also um, uh, for, you know, we have, to, we have to keep in mind that in Good Success and in La Salette, and in Fatima, the reign of peace, the triumph of Mary, whatever you, the, uh, and good success, it's called the complete restoration. All of these things are prophesied um, uh, without a doubt. So that's the, um, that's uh, 1846 and 1858. <clears throat> we have Our Lady of Lourdes um, with uh, uh, Bernadette Souberou, uh, and that's at uh, Lourdes, and that's the Immaculate Conception. 1862, St. John Bosco has the vision of the church in peril and the Pope anchoring her two columns, her to two columns, the Holy Eucharist and the Blessed Mother. <clears throat> and if I may, that right there, that uh, dream, the vision by St. John Bosco is perfectly in continuity with Fatima. Um, and I urge everyone, uh, actually, I urge everyone to get that book, that first book that I, I showed, uh, The Whole Truth About Fatima, The Science and the Facts. Get that one 
because, and it's probably available as a PDF online, to be honest. Um, I know you can get them from the Fatima Center. I don't know if we have any in stock right now. We probably do, but you can get it from a lot of places. It's a massive printed book. And <clears throat> it, the, the, the part that's lost a lot, um, probably, I mean, it, yeah, the part that's lost a lot in the sort of modernist age that we're in is the interaction between the, uh, is the interaction between the children, the seers, and the holy angel, the angel of peace, the angel of Portugal. And that's all about Eucharistic devotion. Um, the account of them receiving Holy Communion from the angel is real. I mean, you read that if you want to have a devotional sort of thing to read to grow grow in devotion to the Holy Eucharist, it is incredible. So there's the two pillars that St. John Bosco is looking at, the two columns, the Holy Eucharist and the Blessed Mother. They're, they're teased out with immense detail in the Fatima apparitions in the message. Then in 1874, Pope Leo has the vision of Jesus and the devil. That's the Saint, famous St. Michael saga there. 1903, Giuseppe Sarto is elected Pope Pius X, and that's the battle against modernism. So you almost see here that there's a preparation for what's going to come in the church. Um, and, and you've argued this, and Taylor Marshall argued this, and others. You know, uh, Vatican II is, I think, what does Taylor Marshall say? It's the parade, you know? The, the battle of modernism was happening way before the Second Vatican Council. Um, that's why, uh, you know, uh, Pope St. Pius X was already fighting this with the battle against modernism. So that time leading up, just in that snapshot there from 1830, we have an insistence on the Immaculate Conception. We have an insistence on the fact that there's a great calamity coming in the church, and we have an insistence on the fact that the way that this will be solved will be through greater devotion to the Immaculate Heart, uh, the Blessed Mother, and the Holy Eucharist. And this is where our first Friday and first Saturday devotions come in. Then this major event happens in 1914 with the breakout of the First World War. Let me let me just cut in first. Sure. Um, so <clears throat> there's also a connection with the Immaculate Conception because Pius the Pius the Ninth mm -hmm. uh, sort of dedicates his great acts to the Immaculate Conception. Mm -hmm. So we've got 1854 is when he dogmatizes the Immaculate Conception. That's right. <clears throat> on December 8th, the yep. feast. And that's four years prior to uh, Lourdes yep. confirming that by apparition. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, I, I think that's quite an, quite a correspondence right there, a dogmatized uh, act. And mm -hmm. then an apparition of confirming that mm -hmm. it seems quite important. Um, well, and you know what else yeah. is there too? Um, basically, I mean, on the eve of, uh, the, uh, uh, Lourdes apparition, we have the promulgation and the publication of the devil's gospel, Darwin. Oh, yes. Um, and who is a correspondent with who else? Karl Marx. Oh yeah. So uh, yeah, Karl. Yeah. The other thing is, so 1848 <laughs> yes. is... Karl Marx publishes the Communist Manifesto, I believe, mm -hmm. January, February. And yeah. then the 1848 revolutions are sweeping Europe. Exactly. So everybody's mob violence mm -hmm. is erupting <clears throat> to try to overthrow sovereigns yep. on the basis of the liberal ideas contained in the American and French revolutions. Mm -hmm. And then that same year, that summer, in Seneca Falls, United States, you have the first feminist convention. Yes. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. Yeah. And then it goes on a tirade yeah. about a revolt against man, yeah. which is essentially a just, it's a just critique against the denigration of Mary, essentially, because the Protestants had denigrated Mary mm -hmm. and then they mm -hmm. had subsequently denigrated woman, which exactly. is what happens when you denigrate Mary. And so the women are revolting against a an oppression that they were actually facing under these men. Yep. But they are latching on to the liberal idea that that uh, power is dignity. That's exactly. how you have dignity is you have power. And so that is the message of feminism is that if you don't have power, you don't have dignity. And that's that's the false idea for a woman because yep. just because you don't have power does not mean you have 
dignity is that, you know, all sorts of people don't have different sorts of power, yeah, whether exactly. man or woman or child. <laughs> it does not have anything to do with whether or not you have dignity. So the, uh, the liberal revolution is that if you don't have a vote, i.e. you don't have political power, then you're not, you don't have dignity. Well, that's false. Yeah. Uh, so, and the, our lady is the one who repudiates all that because she has the greatest dignity of any human being ever. Yeah. And she, her, her dignity is in her powerlessness, her, her magnification her, of God, her fiat. Yes. Her fiat and her, and her adherence to the divine will. So we have the, all these liberal revolutions are sweeping Europe at the time. Then yeah. we have 1864 also on December 8th. The, the Immaculate Conception, the Syllabus of Errors. That's right. It's an astonishing and, time period. <laughs> yes. And so there, and at the same time, there is an Italian effort to invade the Papal States yep. and take it over. And the, the Ninth Crusade is happening where Catholics from all around the world are gathering around the Pope to fight in his army, literally, yep. against these liberals who are trying to take over Yep. the papal states and at the time the papal states was basically the middle chunk of italy it was a large swath of italy yes the it, the, the <clears throat> modern vatican city is a tiny fraction of what yep. the papal states once were and the council the first vatican council yep. and then it, and that opens on 1869 on the immaculate conception again yep so there's you know, all this correspondence there's a huge franciscan element to all of this as well because um, uh, the 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 uh, octave, the traditional devotion of the Immaculate Conception, that December eighth. One of the reasons why it's so uh, well, one of the reasons. Okay, so the Franciscans had the biggest influence in Guadalupe at that time, or sorry, in Mexico at that time. That's why um, this octave of the Immaculate Conception, which was obviously a always a traditional uh, feast day within, but it wasn't this massive thing in every single calendar. Um, which is why it was being celebrated by the Franciscans. And then um, you think about um, how the Franciscans, being such an incredible order, have been co-opted. Sometimes we focus too much on the Jesuits. You know, they've been co-opted to be this sort of, you know, liberation theology. But but the, the downfall of the Franciscans, um, there are true Franciscans, and I believe there are more true Franciscans left probably than true Jesuits. And that... Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's some true Franciscans. Uh, well, yeah, exactly. And and there's some good ones. I mean, obviously, I, I would talk about Father Isaac, but also, yeah. um, but also there is, um, uh, there's some friars. I can't remember what they're called, but they're based in Kentucky. They do some pretty good stuff. Um, anyway, but the Franciscans have totally fallen as well in most cases. But they've, they're, they're, they're true Franciscans, I think, in my opinion, are more than the Jesuits. And it makes sense because the Franciscans are completely latched on to this uh, dogma of the Immaculate Conception. That's a huge part of who they are. Yeah, that's um, interesting. Yeah, yeah I, because um, it was really Bonaventure, who's a Franciscan, and then Duns Scotus, who's a Franciscan, mm -hmm. who really promoted the dogma as we know it today. Yes. Everybody believed in the Immaculate Conception. The question was how the Immaculate Conception. So mm -hmm. St. Thomas had a different view of the Immaculate Conception, which was a different view of how it came up, came about, basically. Yeah. Um, whereas the, the Franciscan dogma, the Franciscan doctrine is what was dogmatized. Yeah. And so it's really the Franciscans that would have that glory that they have the uh, Immaculate Conception. So that's very interesting. Is there, um, what are the Franciscans doing during this period? Is that just promoting the Our Lady of Guadalupe Immaculate Conception? What are they doing like in this 18, late 1800s? Is that is that a significant part of this story right here? You know what? I don't know. Um, but I do know that, um, well, think about the timeline of St. Maximilian Kolbe. He dies in Auschwitz, so 1840s or 1940s. Um, he's obviously, at that time, he's, I don't know, how old is he? He died, 50, 60 years old, somewhere around there? Okay, he wasn't that old. Um, but he's being formed. Um, and he, so Maximilian Kolbe was present in 1917 at the Vatican when the Freemasons were right. having their, yes. so, and there's, and, and he is, he's at this point, he's inspired to start the militia Immaculata, which is the Knights of Our Lady essentially, right? Um, as a way of fighting Freemasonry. Okay. Um, and that's already 1917. So at that point, he's already a grown man. Um, well, he's actually, I think he was just around his ordination at that point. Yeah. He was in seminary at the time. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, um, so he's born in the late 1800s. So this this time period, I mean, it's a, uh, and if you look at that timeline, um, uh, you don't have to put it back up. I'll just read quickly here. Um, 
but um, it this culminates this whole battle between modernism. You know, side note here, a little tangent. Um, everything that happens in the world happens first in the church. Um, you know, we forget this. So, <clears throat> you know, all grace comes into the world through the altar. From all grace flows into the world through the altar. So if there's a problem in the church, if there's chaos in the church, then chaos in the world will follow. Now, on the other hand, uh, when things are restored in the church, you'll see that first in the church before you see it in the world. This is where um, we've been backwards. Uh, you know, we're looking for a secular, for a, a temporal savior, um, Donald Trump, you know, and yes, obviously, um, you know, these, we need to have, um, there needs to be order in the temporal realm. And sometimes a secular person can facilitate that no matter how flawed they are. Constantine was one of these people. This is true. This is true. I did a great interview with uh, Trad Patrick on corporatism and Mussolini was a very misunderstood figure. You know, I'll, I'll add something just to help him there for a sec, because as an Italian, from a, I'm an Italian citizen and lived in Italy and whatever. Um, most people in Italy really like Benito Mussolini <laughs> and they don't want to admit it to people in, in outside of Italy. It's just this sort of open secret. You know, I remember living there um, and there was this, uh, we, where we live, we had to go get our water. Um, we didn't have to, we could drink the water from our tap, but it tasted funny. It was kind of like well water. Um, but we had to go to this nearby spring where we got this water that's the kind of water where you'd sell it for four dollars a bottle but we would just fill up and it was always running and i was talking to a gentleman there and he goes you know it was mussolini who got the spring ready for us like it was just a part of conversation and they said yeah it wasn't perfect but the trains were on time and nobody was hungry you know that was just the kind of way he talked about it so that's a open dirty little secret for italians there um, but he was another man as well because what does he do he gives back the papal states or he gives back much of what was taken to the to rome um in the 1920s from the 1870s. Anyway, so this battle between good and evil, the saint is personified by Pope Leo's vision with Saint Michael and the devil in the 1870s. All of this is this powder keg. It's just boiling over, coming to a head there. Um, the first Vatican Council's not finished. And from there, we have the false spirit of papal infallibility, the false spirit of ultramontanism, where, um, you know, it's almost not, Obviously, we believe in papal infallibility uh, in the strict terms where it's promulgated. But, you know, when we have this fall of good theological understanding in the church, now, unfortunately, if you were to ask your average Catholic of goodwill, basically, what's the major difference between a Protestant and a Catholic? The first thing they'll probably say to you will be something like the Pope. Um, because um, as the world disintegrates, and Catholic culture disintegrates, the only visible sign that separates Catholics from other so-called, you know, Christian brother denominations, whatever, is just this visible head of the Pope, which becomes sort of a papalatry. Anyway, um, so many things are connected here at this time. Yeah, and I want to just go through some of these real quick before we get to the... Um, before we get to the, the First uh, World War, the Great War, mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask you about some of these. Sure. Because there is there any controversy with the miraculous, miraculous medal? Because I know so the miraculous medal, La Salette, and Lourdes are all approved revelations. There's nothing or apparitions. There's nothing controversial. I know um, La Salette has has a separate sort of secret, which is controversial. Yeah. Uh, which we don't even need to add into this um, yeah. necessarily, but um, that's something that um, Taylor Marshall does deal with that in infiltration. He discusses the different aspects of that. Yep. Uh, but essentially there's another secret in La Salette where she says that the uh, Rome will lose the faith and become the seat of the antichrist, yep. which was placed on the index later after Vatican one, because mm -hmm. that obviously challenges Vatican one in a sense yeah. Um, so there's controversy debate over whether or not that's the real secret or part of the La Salette. I know the La Salette identifies two sins. One is breaking the third commandment, which is working on Sunday. And the other one is blasphemy. The second commandment. Yeah. Uh, it talks about the famine, the pot potato famine that's being meted out as God's wrath for yep. breaking these two commandments. Yeah. Uh, it's very interesting that all three of these are all French as well, because, yes. uh, the French church had very much lain dormant for 200 years because yep. they were in rebellion against the Council of Trent. Yep. And then finally the French Revolution comes 
mm -hmm. punishes the French people. They repent and the church is reborn. <clears throat> yep. Um, but is there anything I'm not I'm not aware of anything controversial in regards to the Mac this metal. Is there more of a message to the Mac this metal to uh, uh, St. Catherine Lobo Le You know, I don't know that. Um, um, I I'm not really I don't think there's much of a controversy. It's a pretty uncontroversial event if i'm not mistaken the only thing is if we think about what the miraculous metal tells us i think it fits into those two pillars of the christology and the mariology coming together um so that's sort of that's all i can really think about okay so we got yeah. the miraculous metal no one really questions that yeah. we've got la salette so we do have this this other secret which is is questionable in in certain ways uh to my knowledge yeah the rest you know, of it, it, go ahead i might add there that that kind of um well, that fits into the fact that there's controversy about the third secret um, with Fatima and um, famously, we'll get there eventually, but famously um, John the 23rd has said, you know, that he doesn't want to, that basically says the third secret is not for our times. We don't have time for these prophets of doom. Um, and then Pope Benedict the 16th later on says that the th content of the third secret, because he's seen it. I mean, a Pope, Pope Benedict, oh man. Talk about somebody who knows where all the skeletons are buried. He's pre-Vatican I or pre-Vatican II, during Vatican II, post-Vatican II, and somehow still, I mean, it's just the things that he knows. And, um, but he said that the contents of the third secret is largely the same as, as Akita, which talks about fire from the sky and bishops against bishop and all this kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, that's got a continuity as well. That's another apparition that has a continuity as well with Fatima, good success, La Salette and so forth. Um, Anyway, go on. You were saying something. Oh, yeah. I was just uh, shout out to Taylor Marshall. I just pulled it, picked up his book. So he has two, the two versions of La Salette mm -hmm. uh, in the back, which is interesting. It says that uh, in 1851, it said, perish this city soiled with all sorts of crimes will perish infallibly, um, yeah. which is, which did happen in 1870. There was a communist revolution in Paris, in Paris. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. The timing of that is astonishing, eh? Yeah, it says Marseille will be destroyed, which was destroyed by the Germans in 1944. Um, the world will surrender to its impious passions. Um, when things, when these things happen, the disorder will be complete on the earth. The Pope will be persecuted on all sides. He will be shot at. He will be put to death, but nothing will be done to him. The Vicar of God will triumph again this time. Uh, priests and nuns will be persecuted. A famine will reign at the same time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, it talks about the great king. This is all the, in the uh, sort of the approved secret, and then the the uh, unapproved secret, which is controversial, is the one that's a, a lot longer, which is where it talks about um, Rome will lose the faith and become the seat of the Antichrist. The demons of the air, together with the Antichrist, will perform great wonders on earth and the atmosphere, and men will yep. become more and more perverted. God will mm -hmm. take care of his faithful servants and men of goodwill. Um, the church will be in eclipse. <clears throat> the world will yep. be in dismay. Um, so it's very apocalyptic, uh, but this is the this is the other secret, which, so he Marshall talks about different ways to uh reasons that he would argue it should be accepted uh it was given an imprimatur at first although it was later put in the index Pius the 10th commended um the saint mm -hmm. as a great saint and so um it's it's uh, debatable you know it's my conspiracy hat uh, my conspiracy senses are tingling and um <laughs> The great wonders of the air and the demons of the air, you know, that almost makes me think of why do we have such an obsession with aliens in our day? Um, there's actually a, there's a, just side note, there's a ooh, Saint Gabriel, if I'm not mistaken, 8th century, 9th century, 7th somewhere around there, um, has a prophecy about basically, it sounds exactly like aliens, that people would be deceived by demons in the air and they'd call them something else. And anyway, that's a whole other thing. Um so I just looked at the miraculous metal. Um, the miraculous metal, uh, actually, and I should have I should remember this, has a lot of continuity with the Fatima apparition as well. Because um, on the front side of the metal, 
Uh, you have the mother, her arms are open. Okay, this is a recourse we haven't heard. The Immaculate, the words conceived without sin, assumed into heaven, and mediatrics, and uh, the mediatrix. So she has her hands, the rays are coming from her hands. And if you go to what happens in the Fatima apparitions, Sister Lucy talks about um, basically Our Lady at the end of the first apparition. She releases like this divine light, this divine energy from her hands. And it's the most beautiful, breathtaking, you know, participation in the divine that the children could ever imagine, even more than the angel, the angelic one previously. And uh, it was just known, these simple little children who were literate at the time uh, and knew their basic catechism, obviously. Um, but uh, they knew that she was giving graces to the world. That was her. So there's a continuity between there and there. I think that's, that's why it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And uh <coughs> Yeah, that's excellent. Um, and as far as Logoda, uh, Lords, Lord, there, Lord <laughs> thank you. Um, the uh, I'm not aware of any controversy with that either. Um, just <coughs> being, I am the Immaculate Conception, and uh, I, there's not much of a message there, right? What, what's what's going on? Is there anything mm. controversy with with uh, Lords? Not that I can think of. Maybe we can come back to that next time if I remember. But, but as far as Saint John Bosco, that one is not well known. No. Is that how much approval does that uh, vision have? Is it simply a vision that is contained in one of his writings? Yeah, um, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't think there's any controversy about it being a true vision. I mean, um, I've, I've seen it in many different places. Um, I mean, it's private revelation for sure. Um, but you know, the way we, it's, I guess it's a Catholic prophecy. So the way we understand whether a Catholic prophecy is legit or not, is we see a continuity with others and it doesn't have any, uh, it's, it's sort of, it's, 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 it's validated by the events that come after it, especially with Fatima, with, I said, the devotion to the Holy Eucharist and the blessed mother. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, yeah, definitely Pius the 10th is the really the one who promotes frequent communion. Yes. And this is something that is really against the Jansenist heresy, which had mm -hmm. been going on for centuries and yep. the church had attempted to suppress it, but because of the rebellion of civil authorities, Jansenism mm -hmm. had continued to spread, which is mm -hmm. essentially a, a Puritan style rigorism, which, which says that um, it was against the sacred heart of Jesus. It was against uh, frequent reception of the Holy Sacrament. Um, it was basically against laxism, which was which is a good thing, uh, yep. but it went to the extreme. And yeah. so um, Pius X brings that to the fore and promotes the Holy Sacrament. Yeah, Pius, Pius X is, uh, I think there's a reason why the Society of St. Pius X, why the legacy of Pius X is really hated by the, the, new, the new movements in the church. And I actually, in our diocese, the Church of St. Pius X was renamed. And a friend of mine wrote into the bishop at the time because it's actually very dubious that that, that that is even allowed in canon law because it basically says, I can't remember the canon, but um, you're never allowed to rename a church essentially. Like the name, the saint given to it, it's in perpetuity. Um, but there was two parishes that were amalgamated and uh, the main one was Pius X. They took one, they said, well, we're not renaming it. It's, not, it's no longer the same parish was the idea. Um, but Pius X, you know, he's such a modern saint, if you think about it. I mean, we're talking he's First World War. This is the modern era. And um, you very rarely ever hear about him in the sort of conservative Novus Ordo world. Um, they know he's a saint. Um, but because he he uh, he really is the, he's the hammer of modernism. You know, he is the Pope who is doing everything that he possibly can to give the work, to give the world a bulwark against encroachment of modernism. And it really is symbolic, the fact that he dies, they say, basically of a broken heart um, uh, with the with the coming of the calamity of the sec of the First World War. And, you know, he look at that. He dies 18 days or 22 days after the uh, the breakout of the First World War. And this is the beginning of the end of of christendom essentially i mean in the, in the truest sense of the word you have the turks are massacred the Arman armenian christians the holy roman empire came to an end uh, officially with you know the habsburgs being done russian christianity was destroyed um, and the collective insanity of the 20th century death ideology begins the lights go out 
and waves of madness pummel the Christian world. That's taken from Antonio Sochi's book, The Fourth Secret of Fatima, which is also available. I believe it's available as a PDF. I'm not sure, but it's an incredible book. Um, and uh, there you go. So that brings us to Pope Pius X. Yeah, I just ask uh, if anybody has questions, thoughts, uh, on any of this, we, we just wanted to, this is an introduction to the whole topic, giving the setup for the whole Fatima period, mm -hmm. beginning with starting in the Great War. Um, somebody in the chat is mentioning uh, the Jansenists, Our Lady appeared to the Laos, the French Alps, to Benoit Ressoulet from 1664 to 1718 to fight against the Jansenism, which is nice. Uh, didn't know that. Thanks for sharing. Um, I was just looking up the, there is the controversy, there is some controversy with Pope Leo XIII's vision. Mm -hmm. uh, because there are a, a certain different number of visions uh, recorded. Um, one account of the, the, the discussion where uh, Satan talks to Leo XIII and says, um, or no, it's um, God showed Satan to the, um, God had shown Satan to the vicar of his divine son on earth, just like he did with Job. Satan was bragging that he had already disseminated the church on a large scale. Um, and then that's when um, the idea of, of God giving Satan time to destroy the church to like in, in the situation of Job, uh, how much time do you need? He says 50, 60 years, have more freedom the time you need, then we'll see what happens. Uh, so that's an account from 1947. So it, it's, it, it's quite a bit later, um, but that is allegedly the conversation that happened back in 1890 with Leo the 13th. Um, there's the testimony of Giovanni Battista Nassali Rocca di Corneliano died, died in 1952. That was when um, the, there was also a vision. So there's, this is uh, covered in infiltration by Marshall, but uh, there's some dispute as to what the nature of the vision was, but we do know that Leo the 13th did add the St. Michael prayer. Mm -hmm. That was certainly publicly known. Um, so we have that and, Oh, I'll add to, yeah, um, uh, Pope Leo. What year was 1874? Um, that's when, yeah, that's what you have on here. 1974 so, so, 18, um, is the vision. But there's also Satan mentions like the hundred years to destroy the church. Yeah. Also uh, on October 13 is when yes. that. Uh, yes. There you go. And Pope Pius XII died on October, or it was laid to rest on October 13th in 1958. Um, uh, and May 13th. What's the that's that's the original Halloween. Uh, All Saints, <laughs> and and that's when the that's seriously that's so that's that's a super important date of and that's in six something or other I can't remember. Um, but that is you know, sixth, seventh century or something. But well, that's when the that was the stamp of approval. The Roman Church had baptized the Roman world fully to the point where the pantheon of the gods was turned into the the, the uh, commemoration of the communion of the saints. Um, so it's fully, um, you know, there's a beautiful story about Tolkien walking with C.S. Lewis and the thing that got C.S. Lewis to finally assent to at least the Christian idea because C.S. Lewis was worried about losing all the glory of the great myths because he was a great student of um, the Norse myths and things like that. And Tolkien said, they, they called him Jack, right? And they said, Jack, you don't understand. Christianity is the myth that came true. And I thought that was a beautiful way of, uh, of talking about it. Anyway, but um, uh, the, the, the dialogue between Pope Leo, I'm sorry, the dialogue between the devil and God that Pope Leo talks about. Satan asks for a hundred year reign. And basically, it's almost like he's saying, I need 100 years. And God said, sure, take 100 years. You know, it's not going to work. And um, there's a people sometimes associate 1917 to 2017. But as we'll go in later in our series here, the instructions for how to do the consecration to the Immaculate Heart of Mary of Russia was given 1929. Um, and our Lord comes to Sister Lucy in 1931 and tells her that already two years after this has been said that uh, basically heaven is is upset with what's going on and said the same fate would befall the church as had befallen France 
and that was a hundred year problem. So it's 16, this is St. Mary Alacoque and the consecration of France to the Immaculate or to the um, Sacred Heart. And that was in 1679, 100 years to the day, 1770, or I'm getting my dates wrong. 1879. Yeah. I'm sorry, 1779. You're right. Yes. Okay. Okay. And um, 100 years to the day. And that was the day when the upstart third estate took the legislative power away from the king in the French uh, political procedure. And then four years later to the day, 1783, king is beheaded. Trying to, and he was trying to have the consecration of France to the Sacred Heart done from his jail cell. But it was too late, 100 year window. Now, the only difference is with Fatima, is what's promised, is that, and our Lord says this, and Our Lady alludes to it, but the consecration will happen and her Immaculate Heart will triumph, but it will be done late. So does that mean that we will have a hundred year window that relates to this hundred year prophesied by this dialogue between the devil and God that Pope Leo talks about, the hundred years to destroy the church? Does this mean by the time 2029 comes around? We have that hundred year window of the window for the consecration done and we have a destruction of the church. I don't know, but it also, this is why it's hard to reconcile with. It really is. It's difficult to see because if um, we'll talk about this more in depth, but if we think about the consecration and I know we'll debate this as we go, but if we think about the narrative of the consecration not having happened and somehow it has to happen in this hundred year window, I mean, I don't see Pope Francis, whoever's going to come after him in the next eight years. <laughs> organizing this, uh, you know, sort of true consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart. But we somehow have this promise that the Immaculate Heart will triumph and that the consecration will be done and it'll be done late. Anyway, I don't understand it. So, okay. Yeah. yeah. Hey, just a correction. People in the chat are correcting us. So the, the 1789, 89, 1789 is, is one on the one. It's the adoption of the American constitution. That's right. Which is a problem in the first place. Yeah. suppresses Christ the King, all right. that. Mm -hmm. But at the same same year is the French Revolution right. begins 1789, mm -hmm. and then 1793 is the execution of Louis the Sixteenth. That's right. I was getting 79 and 89 mixed up, but yeah. Yes. So that is it. Um, so we're going to talk about more Fatima next week. We're going to continue with this. We'll hit the Great War. There's a lot of. We might get to the first apparition by then. <laughs> As a lot of intense things happening with the Great War, people don't think about World War One anymore because they think about World War Two. Mm -hmm. uh, but it it's it's really a, an, a time of epic proportions. It's kind of the response of the world to Vatican One. Vatican mm -hmm. One is proclaiming the monarchy of the Church. Yeah. Seven, 1918 is the end of all monarchy. Mm -hmm. So uh, we will get into that next week. But for now, let's offer up on our Father. Uh, for all of our Lenten intentions, acquiring the virtues we stand in need of, and overcoming the vices which afflict us. Remember, the true crusade is against the world, the flesh, and the devil. So let's fight against the enemies of Holy Church for the sake of souls. Let's pray. Nomine Padre, Sifidi, Spiritu Sancti, Amen. Pater nostra requies in jedi sanctificetum nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum, fia valentas tua, sicut in cerdo et in terra. Panem nostrum quotidianum da nobis odie, et emitti nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimittimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, sed libera nos a malo. Amen. Nomen in pace, servidi spiritu sancti. Amen. Through the prayers of our holy fathers, Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Amen.